shifting gears just a little bit for the last few minutes and then you know just to leave people with a lot of hope that there are things that we can do and that is with surgery and what that would look like um, and I really believe that it's aesthetic functional surgery it's it's surgery to get back how you look and how you feel and I think the goal that I always take is to do this in as few surgeries as possible. We've really developed techniques where we can almost do this most of the time in one surgery, maybe two. But really to cut down on the downtime and to take in the full, um, you know, the, all the appearance issues that go into this, into this pretty tough disease. So there are key factors, and that is what, having a long discussion with the patient about what their goals are. And some patients want a big improvement, and some patients just want a little bit of improvement. But the first thing is figuring out the goals, because the more surgery you do, the more risk you take. So the first thing is just figuring out, well, what is the balance? You know, are you a risk taker and you want everything, or are you, and you're gonna be okay with however that turns out, or are you a very conservative person? And the biggest risk here is double vision. And you know, for people who don't have double vision, it's often anywhere from five to ten percent that can be corrected usually with additional surgery. But it does require additional surgery. That's the biggest risk. I always think of the bulging eyes as kind of a guy who's who's not been to the gym for a while, um, and you know, you just can't. It's hard to kind of cover this up as anyone uh, who's approached middle age uh, knows, and myself included, that you know, you just can't pull the pants tighter. Um, because you have such a vector there, it, it's, but you have to do something about the bulge. And we always think of this as a negative vector, and I think of this as the eye bulging and then the pants as kind of being like the cheek. You know, we're, we're really looking, no matter what you do to the eyelid and surgery around the eyelid, you can't really make up for that eye bulging, that negative vector of that eye that's in front of that cheek. It just changes the appearance, especially in person, even much more than in photographs of what someone looks like. And this is just an example of what the, what the orbit looks like, um, where that eye is sitting. And you can see this whole surrounding bony area is kind of like a, a cone, like an ice cream cone that's surrounded by these bones. And what we do, and what I do, is kind of pick and choose which bone to kind of expand or to make more room behind the eye. Because normally the eye sits very nicely surrounded by some muscle, it's a very natural appearance, and it's kind of nestled in around these, this bony orbit. But what happens when it bulges is it looks very different. This is actually the same size eye, but it just looks very, very different because it's now um, much more bulging. It's not hiding behind the bone in a natural way with that supporting cast. And you can kind of see the difference in appearance between those two. And so what we want to do is move this eye back, make that bulging much less, put that guy on a, on a little bit of an exercise diet program to improve things. And you can see how this really looks in, in real life. So we often turn to customized approaches for orbital decompression. And orbital decompression is, is a really scary thing on the internet. Um, I've seen the videos and, and, and I'm scared of it. But um, it actually is done through an incredibly small incision, often with no skin incision sometimes, or with a very small skin incision in the upper eyelid crease. And with the new techniques, it's usually a surgery about an hour, hour and a half, come in and go home the same day, um, and about a week or two of, of recovery with swelling and bruising. And what we do is, again, we target various areas um, in the anatomy to make a little bit more room and allow that eye to come back. It, that eye has been pushed forward by all the extra tissue behind it, and we're just making more room. We can either remove some of the fat around it, or we can make the bone opening a little larger and allow that to come back. And I want to finish with some examples, because I think examples and patient stories, perspective, and hope that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. This is a patient of mine from Chicago, and um, she had uh, one surgery just on the eyes uh, to achieve this result. And we just did a, uh, a, a recent interview, so to speak, of her and her experience. And she now has a child. And this was, you know, I knew her before she was married, before she had any children. This, this was obviously something that um, she felt that impaired her life. Um, and and you know, and finding a partner and just making it through the day. 
And so Christina is really, I think, a great example of a person who whom re-engages after life, after this type of surgery. And there's a, some, some more examples where people have various severities, you know, where we've moved the eyes back um, to various degrees and you can see an improvement of the surrounding tissue. And some, or these are chosen almost sequentially, some are better than others. This is just a person who has very bad double vision who had to have a decompression move the eyes back and then straightening of the eyelids. But you know the idea is you want to try to achieve as much of this as possible in one sitting, um, customizing everything so you don't need additional surgery. There aren't a lot of surgeons who do this, but it, the most important thing is, is choosing people who do do a lot of this surgery and can customize it. For example, we can lower the eye and, and reduce the amount of white showing under the eyelid. Most people hate this white called scleral show showing under here. You can raise the eyelid and put in grafts. It doesn't really look natural, but instead you just kind of move the eye back to a certain position and then that will allow the eyelid to come up. And it's just another example of that where we can manipulate the eye position to give a much more natural improvement. And this is just a young girl from Texas who was going to go to college um, and actually delayed her colleges because uh, her grades kind of started to fall apart when um, she was um, you know, going through her graves, thyroid issues, and then also the eye issues. The, as I said, it doesn't just stop at the eyes, there's also the cheeks where this causes an expansion, it causes a lot of bulging under the eyes. People have premature aging where they all of a sudden never knew that they had bags that can be composed of fat and fluid, and we can hide these even with non-surgical interventions such as filler. And we do surgery in these cases often release that ligament here that, that causes this, do a little bit of extra surgery, it takes a few extra minutes, and then give a little cheek lift, and that can often result in a nice softening of the appearance um, without having to do a whole lot of extra surgery, but just an improvement depending upon what someone has. This is just another example of someone who's had some pretty bad eye disease, but we did a little cheek, a little eyelid, um, all at the same time, and all through no, and all through just an upper eyelid piece incision or an incision inside the eyelid, no extra incisions, and just a little um, release of the malar ligament. And just another um, patient um, who we don't use any eyelid incisions, but can do everything from inside, is because in Asian patients um, in our practice, you know, it's very hard to hide incisions in Asian patients with the eyelid crease. Um, so we try even not to even use those. Um, and so I just want to kind of leave you with the, you know, the, um, you know, thought that, you know, this really is an aesthetic um, functional surgery. It's mostly functional and so anyone that causes it, calls it cosmetic, um, you know, I, 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 again, would push back strong and hard about that. And that, you know, while the medicine will take the place, I think, on large part of some of our surgeries, I still think that this causes enough issues that, and there are things that can be done about it. It's not right for everyone. It just has to be thought of in something that and fits in with the patient's goals. And it's, all, it's never a problem to delay this type of surgery because waiting is often better than moving forward with anything too soon. Go ahead, please. So if a payer uh, insurance company sees the word aesthetic in front of the word functional, how likely am I to get that reimbursed, or you to get that reimbursed? Well, when, I, when we talk to insurance companies, we use very different language. And, Thank you. Um, <laughs> so, what I, I need you to. So this has always been thought of as a functional bloody surgery when I go to national conferences. It's always one of those things that, well, we just go in and we take out the sinuses and we just move the eyes back, and, and no one really pays attention to well, does the patient look and feel better after you've done this? Um, so I use it mostly for my physician colleagues um, when I say aesthetic functional. Just like, hey, we know a lot of aesthetic techniques. We do cosmetic and aesthetic surgery. We can apply that here pretty easily, um, you know, and, and give people back a, a better appearance in addition to a better function. And, you know, they go hand in hand. Form follows function. And so what appears to be beautiful is actually very functional, and so they go hand in hand. When we talk in, to insurance companies, we talk in codes. They don't, they don't talk in anything except you know, a, a, a five-digit code, so that's what we use. 
when you talk about uh, the possibility of tepro uh, reversing or, or helping patients with long-term disease, are you talking about reversing, you know, fibrosis of the eye muscle? Well, maybe. So we're investigating that. So what it's shown to do in the first study is it improves the strabismus, improves the double vision, it improves the quality of life, it improves the inflammation, and it improves the eye bulging. It hit on every one of those four measures as being significant, so it's really exciting. All the patients, when we designed this study, were all within nine months of diagnosis just because we felt that that was the most likely time to get, a, a big, to get the most beneficial result. In the second study, the phase three trial, we had a crossover of all the people who have gotten placebo, they've now crossed over and will receive the medicine in an open label fashion. That study will help us guide whether those patients who are outside that nine month window would ever receive any benefit. Don't know the answer to that question yet. Um, I've had colleagues who don't work in the field say, well, there's no possible way that that would ever work. You'd never reverse fibrosis. I'm unconvinced of that. Um, I think that the same mechanisms that you're impairing may inhibit and may reverse some of the Hyaluronian accumulation. It may not be nearly as effective as far as fibrosis, but it may be effective upon the Hyaluronian accumulation. You know, right now, it's just a guess. So patients uh, are currently in your study or in a study that, that have long-term disease? Um, patients are, so all patients in the phase three study were exactly as I showed, they all were diagnosed within nine months of the eye, within nine months of having the eye disease to enroll in the study. They received 24 weeks of therapy, either a placebo therapy or the medicine itself. If they don't respond after 24 weeks, so they're op, you know, so these are patients now have had disease maybe up to a year or more. Um, then they get cro they are, are allowed if they would like to cross over and receive the drug on open label. And so these would be patients who may have been diagnosed up to a year or slightly more receiving the drug to see if it actually helps. It would be the first indication that we have of, of where of what it might whether it might help or not. So we don't, but I don't know the answer to that. But they were all part of that initial study. When will those results be available? Um, we August thirty first, we had enrolled the last patient uh, here in Los Angeles, um, and we have her, a representative from a couple representatives from Horizon who owns Teprotuma Mab. We're trying to figure out how to get this to patients in the best way um, here today, but they um, it, so it would be twenty four weeks when the data is available after that August 31st patient, several a couple more months till the FDA reviews it you know, from there. But the patients on the crossover will probably have to wait a while longer because they have to go through potentially even another 24 weeks of treatment. So before we know the long term, the patients with long term disease, probably another year or year and a half. Is there a trial plan for people had diagnosis for three or more years? Uh, eventually, yes. I mean, you know, the first step would be making this drug available because right now it's not available. It's not like another drug that's already available for some other disease. It's not available anywhere except for the trial. So the first step is, is seeing whether, it, you know, getting it approved.